How is everybody doing today? Welcome to the Sounds Like Liberty podcast. This is episode number 42 from the Launchpad Media. Always launching ideas in your direction. I'm your host, as always, the illustrious Nikki P, here with my beautiful wife and co host, Lizzie. How are you doing, baby? I'm doing all right. It's what it is to yell at 42. I have no idea what you're Ella. talking about. Ella, the Hitchhiker's Guide. Okay, well, what I know I'm, I'm talking about that. is. I've been interrupted 30 fucking times trying to record this episode this morning. <laughs> not 42 times. It is. It is. No, it is not 42 times. More Douglas Adams humor, everyone. <sighs> no, I've just been, we've been trying to record it and we keep getting stopped as people from my day job keep calling me and I'm like. <sighs> yeah, I know. Like I'll get 30 seconds into the show and there they go. <laughs> and we're already so excited about the day job. It's fun. <sighs> yeah. So. I think th- I think I'm glad we chose the song that we did today. Well, there you go. Because you know the vitriol of work is gonna right you, gonna you're, feed you're into ready. this. You're right there. So yeah, we actually have a lot of fun stuff coming on today. It's, I've got a record. Show. I'm really excited to talk about. And I heard this happen. We yeah. got a fun song to analyze. Yeah. I'm looking forward to Pork Fest. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to bonus content that's coming out. I'm really looking forward this to this week. It's all. And I'll probably put it out in the main feed. Okay. People want to hear. It. Tell me if you want to hear about it. There we go. It's me and uh, my buddy Ben, the Liberty Hippie, talking about environmentalism Being and all, free markets. All green and jazz. Yep. Uh, anyways, the uh, we also have a crazy interview. You know, we have half of a crazy interview. Half of a crazy interview because there wasn't enough enough room in yeah, one episode. I, I couldn't. For all of the goodness. I mean, I'm going to cut it down to fit in the show. Yeah. And then still have to cut parts out of it to fill up another show and still be, like, have not all of it make it to the it's show. just so much of this interview. Um, so if you like what you hear, you can you can check out the uh, the Freedom Choir and see about getting around. Oh, my God. The whole, it's all intense and insane. Yeah, it's been up there for a while, but... Yeah. So... <laughs> so... We got a song here by No Effects. Yep. One of my favorite songs by No Effects. Great, great song. But it also illustrates why that's the, that's that whole income and cap split. Like yeah. they get things so right and so fucking wrong. And we're gonna talk about it, I guess. Okay. I'm I'm down. So why don't you start us out here, uh, bleeding heart disease. Okay, how money polluted my mind, dough, for our lives are lived for, Ray, just a crazy Aussie, me, the generation forges on, Bo, fodder for corporations, well, I don't know how he sings that. It's, it's fa. Oh, okay, fa. But they put the O in there because it's fodder. Right, okay, I gotcha. Uh, sewing our lives together. La, such a place to get shot. <laughs> such a nice place to get shot. <laughs> I'm sorry. But don't forget the T. It follows liber in the Constitution, following the part about pursuit of happiness, the byproduct of colonial precious metal mine extracts, which brings us back to do. Do, 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 do. I, I love the way that the Saul structure on do, re, mi, fa, so, la, yeah, do. Yeah, no, it's fun. <laughs> I, I was tickled. Um, so what's he saying there? What do you uh, What do you want to pull out of okay. that verse well, there? Well, here's the thing. Mm-hmm. So you, you, technically how money polluted my mind is the intro to the song. Right. And uh, I'll address the naming of the song when we get later on. Okay. So we'll start it out with He's he's talking about the fact. Essentially, he's talking about the fact that n- companies run everything. Okay. And that money runs the world. Okay. Okay. And 
I don't know that we would actually probably argue that. I think we do believe that money runs the world. Yeah. I mean, one of the big libertarian issues is the Federal Reserve Bank and how it fucking corrupts money globally. Um, but there's certain, like, obviously colonialism and going out and fucking up other countries is something we, we absolutely care about. Mm-hmm. The difference, I think, that what we're going to find in the song is that we don't look at the government as being something fundamentally different than any of the corporations involved. Okay. So. I haven't really heard too much about the government. I mean, he talks about the Constitution. Well, I guess maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it seems implied. Okay. I, I, I guess... Colonialism doesn't have shit to do with money. That has to do with governments. Okay. So, like, it has to factor in there at some point. But I think that's a slip. I think you're pointing out, actually, a slippery thing that they do. They they try and obfuscate what is actually going on. Um, let's go on. All right. Today I saw a kid torture a cat. Too much leisure teenage Norman Rockwell paints it black. We've definitely seen what leisure time has done to fucking people in the fabric of society in our country for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, I think there have definitely been, um... Look, SJWs don't exist in a world where everybody's gotta go work. A <laughs> free time. <laughs> Just say it. You know, I, I think that people that go and shoot up churches in Christchurch, mm-hmm. New Zealand, probably didn't spend as much time on 4chan probably didn't end up having that happen. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. The idle idle hands and all that jazz. Yeah. Yeah. So, why don't you give me the next one? Alright. Uh, don't ex... Whoa, nope. Sorry. How d- the, did the chain get started? Mo More, more <laughs> is what everybody wants. Na- needy is what none of us are. Corporation died last night. Cooperation. Cooperation. Died last night. Ruptured, bleeding heart foresight. Me, I'm just a Lou. <sighs> okay, so in this particular bit, he's kind of questioning how did this whole thing get started. Okay. Um, I think we could all say he, he's trying to fight human nature on this. He, he say, he's simultaneously saying that we don't respect what we have, but we all want more. Okay. That's literally how human beings are wired. Yeah. We are so you, always going to move you, the goalposts. You, you can't... You, yeah, you, uh, Jason Stapleton will say it's, you know, everyone wants increase. That's the yeah. word he uses. Um, so, you know, once again, he they look at the want as the, the problem. Yeah. And not... The want being facilitated by the government at the expense of others. Okay. Like, we all want more. We all want to do better. We all want the next generation to have it better than we did. We like Those are all things we want. If you don't, you're a piece of shit, frankly. If you really want your kid's life to be worse than yours, I don't know what the fuck's wrong with you. You're bad people. Fair point. Um... Once again, like he, they see these issues, but they're attributing what, or misattributing what, what, what the the cause. Is. Yeah. So, so don't expect the least. You won't be disappointed when you take a bite and watch the worm crawl back inside. Listen to the fairy tales of million dollar happiness, Los Angeles lifestyle, Chardonnay. Um. I don't disagree here. I think that the whole consumerism idea is perpetuated specifically through government. Like the, the the whole idea of, you know, look at these Hollywood elites. Well, all those Hollywood elites fucking vote for the same people to keep in government. That are all perpetuating the the whole steamrolling. So you're saying we beings. wouldn't have that level of wealth and consumerism? He, I mean, the whole bleeding of heart disease thing in here, I think, is he's picking on the fact that you have all these Hollywood celebrities that talk about money and making the or they they talk about how evil things are and they're living a lifestyle that fucking is living off of like the worst of that. Yeah, I think he's wrong. I think that you know capitalism is great. Sure. And. The people that get paid that get paid that because they increase people's lives in some way. 
Okay. Like, you went and saw the fucking movie. You gave them your money. You could have easily saw something different or did something different with your money. Right. If you thought that it was enter- the value of it was worth exchanging. But it is bullshit. Like, we can... We can kind of talk about the hypocrisy of all these fucking leftists that are, what do you want to say? All the leftists that are out there bitching about all this and this and this. Like, environmentalism is my favorite one with fucking, uh, what's his name? Leonardo DiCaprio who goes out and talks about the environment and then flies around on his private jet while doing that. Yeah, okay, fair enough. (laughs) So, and, and I think that Fat Mike would say, like, maybe he's not wrong in that there is something that's wrong in human beings' hearts, like, that makes them act this way. But hmm. I don't think that capitalism is the problem. I think that it's it's not paying attention to human nature that's the actual issue. Well, there is always um, the power angle of it, I think. You don't have the power to take huge amounts of money or control the money Look, in huge parts of the world then um, whatever issues in human nature have less chance of affecting quite as many people well I mean the pursuit of million dollar happiness yeah like, that's you know what we're talking about in here like, he clearly thinks that it's the actual fucking money that's the problem oh, this is what's it's people go taking the money like well you're not going to stop people from wanting to make their material lives better yeah you want to everyone wants to I guess maybe with the exception of some crust punks, but that's, they're not people, so. I'm not going to touch that, that's fine. You don't have to touch it, I'll, I'll, I'll own it. Okay. Um, so yeah, when the song ends was, it's probably one of my favorite lines ever. Happiness was killed, we watched it bleed. Some say it died from hate, some say from bleeding heart disease. There you go. Um, which, y- you can speculate as to what he's really getting at there. I think that there's you know, he's glossing over the fact that yeah people with a lot of money aren't any more happy than anyone else. Look what look at little you know Robin Williams conundrum. Yeah. You know I think I think people should perhaps be more happy with uh you know less maybe but at the end of the day we're not that's just not the way we're programmed. I think it's a matter of values and you can adjust those in certain ways, but you can't obviously decide that for other people. So it's, uh, I don't know. I think it's always going to be a challenge. I do not disagree. And I think recognizing the challenge for what it is, is the important part. Yeah. As opposed to just trying to make it somebody else's fault. So, all right. What do we what do we want to give this one? I mean, yeah, I think I think we can firmly put him put him over there with the uh, with Dylan, yeah. And there's the parting. It's like, well, we can, because I like the song. Maybe I can give it in the middle and say, well, I mean, they they got the problem. They're just misdiagnosing it, and yeah. No, it's it's straight up. You know, it's straight up comedy. Straight up commie trash, you know. Fair enough. So, anyways. Welcome to I Heard This Happen, the segment for aging hipsters. Each week we scour Bandcamp for underground new releases to wow your teenage children. So without further ado, here's new music. Let's, uh... Let's talk about some records here. Okay, let's do that. I'll I'll go first since you are oh so excited about your record. I will just go ahead and. Are get you my, not excited about your record? I am excited about my record, which is why I want to get it in there before you're all like gushing in genres and blah blah blah. Um, I have a, <laughs> a um, fruit juicy good. I know there was a good good candy back in the day. Um, the album's called What's Past Is Prologue. Um, and no, it's not by Shakespeare. Um, the artist is actually Free Throw. They're from Nashville, and they're like a pop, pop, punk, alternative emo somewhere in their band. Like they remind me of bands like um, Anne Berlin, oh, gross. Blindside, Blindside, Forty One, 
there's like all right none of those bands sound anything like each other i know i understand and i knew you were gonna say that but the fact of the matter is they have like the melodic sort of thing like Anne berlin does in their softer moments but then they get all screamy like blindside and some other moments and they've got like crazy hooky guitar stuff happening which reminds me of some 41 so i feel like at different points in the album it's 12 tracks they touch all those different um all those different spots it's mostly about you know screwing stuff up and being depressed and um anxious and you know just horrified about your life um which but they do they have uh some some candidness in the lyrics and that sort of adds to their charm and you know me i like i like getting the feels from music so i um i can dig it uh you can check it out on Bandcamp. it came out on the 31st all right so what do you got all right, so immediately I saw this name and Chicago, Illinois, and I was like, "Oh my God, it's got to be." Sure enough, it was. Sure enough. Yeah. So uh, my album is "Sleep Is My God." It's an EP by Spencer Tweedy. Mm-hmm. Came out on March 29th. It's four tracks. I'd give it folk, I guess. Okay. Um. Aggressive folk? Could you call it aggressive folk? No, I no? wouldn't even call it that. He, oh. he talks like this. Oh, all right. Like, I don't know Fair enough. I mean, do you think uh, Elliot Smith is aggressive folk? No, is Elliot Smith folk? I would probably call him folk. Really? Okay, fair yeah. enough. One of the types of it. I just always thought of it as rock, but I, as we I know, I'm, depends what's, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, anyone who's genres. whisper talking, I can't imagine is rock. All right, all right, all right, go ahead. Anyways, uh, yeah, so it's Jeff Tweedy's son, Spencer. Um, the album reminds me of, you know, Jeff Tweedy, Wilco, Beck, Elliot Smith, and Ben Queller. Nice. I mean, it's pretty, it's, it's soft, fair, a little noisy, but like, it, it, I think what I was telling you earlier, it reminds me of Wilco the album meets A Ghost is Born kind of smashed together. Yeah. Okay. Um, my favorite song is Wind School. Okay. But the whole album is fantastic. Like, immediately I was engaged from the first second of the first song. Yeah, no, you played a bit of it for me. It was beautiful. So, I don't want to make it sound derivative right off the bat, but it is in the best way possible. I'm not complaining about it sounding like classic Wilco. Hopefully it gets you to listen to it. Okay. I'm looking at the fact that it sounds like Wilco and being very derivative as a good thing. Right. Because, yeah, Wilco's kind of not been releasing great stuff lately. Well, they're just not the same. I don't know band. if it's I don't know if it's him not being on the smack or him being back on the smack. I don't know. But I I think people just grow and change and they make crappy music. I'd like them to not grow and make crappy music, Liz. Well, I mean, there's a lot of bands that say that might just be the way it happens. I don't know. So, I mean, there's an odd, odd soundscaping. Is why I kind of give it that Ghost is Born thing. Like some of the really fuzzed out guitars sound great. Yeah. Um, and I think that they make the more musical elements work better because there's that stark justification. It's got some of the weird, like, production things that Jeff would do on Wilco's records that I really like. Nice. Um, I mean, the, the, I, I, I say this in the nicest like, way imaginable. It sounds exactly what I imagine Jeff Tweedy's kid's album would sound like. <laughs> okay. And... Uh, from a songwriting and a production standpoint, the thing's fucking fantastic. Yeah. Like, it's 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 minimalist in some ways, and it's... I don't know. I'm, getting, I'm just real nerdy about it's this. It's what you want out of this Yes, it's exactly what I wanted album. out of this, yeah. Yes. So, um, but yeah. Nice. That's, uh, that's what I heard happen this week. There we go. Hey, how's it going? Nikki P here. Want to support the show or just give a big middle finger to Patreon? Consider stopping over to supportsll.com. Members of the Freedom Choir get access to the private Facebook group and actual physical merch. Want access to the unedited raw interviews as they're recorded way before they're released? It's in there. Is that not enough? And you want membership to Freedom Song 365? It's in there. There's even monthly bonus swag for top tier supporters. So head on over to supportsll.com. Help Liz and I get to libertarian functions and even just cover the costs of making the show. If I'm not a good enough salesman, how about this? Support my mom and dad and Sounds Like Liberty. Go to supportsll.com. You heard her, folks. Join the Freedom Choir at supportsll.com. So we've got a fun interview here. 
the the fun interview. Well, half of a fun interview. Yeah, because there's a lot of this interview, but we went all to all the places. I'm going to be honest. We I don't talk know about all sorts of the things. I don't know why we do this when he is probably far more capable of doing this than we are. <laughs> like uh, at the end of the day, I kind of just want him to take over our. Uh, our show. Well, you know, uh, to be fair, I got the impression that he's got a lot of other things on his plate. Like he's he's got a lot of balls in the air. Are we, so, so we're just doing this just as a favor to this, him, so he doesn't up, have yeah. to. So he doesn't have to add this to his his huge list of things that he's doing. You're probably right about that. Yeah. So, anyways, we've we've kind of hinted so far. We haven't actually said anything, but we have Jeremiah Harding of the Weekly Hellscape. There you go. Uh, this was just kind of a really, really interesting interview on so many levels. Just ridiculously thought-provoking Yeah, this dude thinks a fucking lot. Yes. Quickly, so, which is cool. Tell you what, I'm going to stop talking about it. Yeah, and just let's just listen to the interview. Get to him thinking about it. There you go. Base. Anyways, welcome to the Sounds Like Liberty podcast. This is going to be a uh, an interesting one because... In general, we talk to uh, ANCAP types, and I, I get the impression from your Matt's interview that that's not exactly where you fall. Well, I'm okay, so I'm not opposed to the idea of ANCAPistan. I just think that without pluralism, there are going to be people that disagree, and those elements will create a pressure that requires a pressure release. Um, I think pluralism is useful in a governed society, and I don't think that that would change in an anarchic paradigm. I think we need to um, allow for many sorts of economic and personal uh, choice, or we're not really anarchists. And I also think that um, the naive assumption that everybody is either a closet capitalist or uh, a tyrant is one of the downfalls of NCAPs that allows them to um, make jokes about throwing people out of helicopters and into wood chippers um, that really make liberty look like a hostile proposition to outsiders and remove any possibility for us to get popular appeal. Um, and realistically, I think uh, capitalism in the sense that ANCAPs mean it, which is contradictory and you know manifestly heterodox to the majority of political thinkers, um, when when they talk about capitalism and it's all about free markets, which in my opinion and according to the facts that I've looked into pretty much has never existed um, since we've all been under a status paradigm for millennia, um, is a potentially good system and does hedge against crises and other things very well. I just don't think it's the be all and end all for everyone. I prefer it. I'm still technically an ANCAP I just also wouldn't mind ANCOMs or mutualists or syndicalists. I am, I'm here for people who want to end the state, and that's my primary motivation and goal. That's why I'm trying to build a framework for what I call anarcho-coalitionism, where the um, anarchist schools stop competing more than they're working together, where we find ways that we could work in the end so that we can work on smashing the state in ways we agree to now. Like, for instance, anarcho-capitalists hate hyper-regulation because it hurts businesses, and anarcho-communists can hate hyper-regulation because it removes their ability to behave peacefully in their communes. Um, that's common ground, and it's common ground people don't talk about because they're too busy talking about they're bullshit non-memes. And that's the other thing, by the way. It's 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 hilarious that people think that they're a part of a serious movement when most of the things they do is sharing images on the internet. I mean, I get that that's cultural transfer, but realistically, it's not going to change the entire world. It's just going to change certain pockets of it. And maybe if you get lucky on the 0 0.01 chance that you'll fucking get that pocket to do anything um that pocket is probably going to be like ridiculed more than it's helpful it's probably going to be looked down on more than it's looked up on and it's also not doing anything just saying something so it really amps up the keyboard warrior image my goal is not to target or eliminate 
anarcho-capitalism or anarcho-capitalists. My goal is to help them win alongside all other forms of anarchists. That's, that's my primary motivation these days is to get people to stop being petty. Because think about it. We make jokes as end caps um, about how not real communism is not a thing people should say when it results in all of these deaths and when people who identify as communists are um, so commonly uh, affiliated with the state and using the state and being jackboots. But the primary like retort from communists is that ANCAPs just like assume that all of this controlled economy and, uh, and government monopoly assisting business is not real capitalism. That's that that's that's the retort that communists can rightly use because it is capitalism. It's capitalism according to all of the definitions. It's just not free market capitalism, which is what ANCAPs want. And that's a distinction that I think is valuable. I think everybody fundamentally on some level, except maybe egoists and red marketers, want <laughs> free markets. And that's why um, C4SS, the Center for a Stateless Society, wrote that paper up on markets, not capitalism, because the distinction is still valuable. Um, so it's not that I don't support anarcho-capitalism anymore. It, it's not like I've abandoned my ANCAP people. Like, they're still my primary audience. But I'm not going to make logical excuses for ignoring what... Uh, what information is in front of me and I'm also not going to think naively that because I think this paradigm of anarcho-capitalism is probably I still need to see testing because I'm sort of a scientifically minded person anyway um, is probably the most effective and the most resilient I still like don't think that my particular persuasion should be the monopoly I don't think that would be anarchy I think that there are plenty of people who disagree and that they should like not only have the freedom but be able to exercise their right to disagree and have different paradigms post-state because if they don't then they're going to feel that we've created a new state and that they are a political minority and they're going to smash our state and that's the pluralism that I'm talking about. Just in the same way that this society needs pressure relief mechanisms, we need pressure relief mechanisms in anarchy or we lose. And I don't want to fucking lose. I've put 10 years into this. I disagree with nothing you said. Maybe I'm a minority in the ANCAP world. But I, I, I mean, I would be more tongue in cheek about it and say, look, I'm happy to go and homestead all of those failed communes when they all die. But, but ultimately... They're allowed to try whatever they want. They Market, markets and I mean, everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because ultimately, if they do fail, it will have been scientifically proven at that point, rather than just being people sneering at each other online. Like, yeah. ultimately, that's what I want to see. I want to see these things succeed or fail on their own merit. I want to see people be able to pull them up by their bootstraps, rather than having all of these things in their way, so that we can finally see, ultimately, um, which words that were in those bullshit fucking ANCAP versus ANCOM Facebook groups um, meet themselves out. That's what I want. Well, I, I want to be able to see these things tested in the field. In the same way for me, like, I'm just, I'm, I'm so sick of the whole left-right thing. That it's, that's just been been grinding, well, right. grinding my guess. Because like, it, what's funny is, like, so within, like, libertarianism, like, I am a member of the, uh, the like, Libertarian Party Mises Caucus just because I figure if the party's going to exist, at the very least, it should have somebody principled there for when a, a collapse happens. That's, at least there's somebody with some kind of principled outlook on what libertarianism is. Um, I don't know that I truly believe in any political action, but unfortunately, when there's people up there that are calling something libertarianism that's not libertarianism, it's frustrating. Um, but, you know, as a, as a bisexual man married to a fucking black woman... I, and getting called a Nazi constantly, it uh, it really makes you question what the whole left-right thing fucking means anyways, because politically I agree with those people on most stuff. You know, it just happens to be, you know, I'm not a conservative. You know, I, I came from the left as far as much that would matter. <laughs> and it's like, well, my beliefs didn't really change all that much, so w what does that mean? Like, that all the people I, get, I, I follow are like Tom Woods's and, you know, guys like that. So, <laughs> well, that's the problem uh, with the left-right politics, and so I've, I've been making a joke <laughs> lately. When, well, 
Partially. So, okay, um, I've been making a joke recently where people ask me where I am on the political spectrum and I say, uh, the bottom line. And it's because, I, I like, to me, anything on that bottom line would be fine. Um, I don't really care at that point. Um, I'd ultimately think that being able to amass capital for potential shocks to whatever markets arise would be the best. So I'm probably closer to the right in terms of where I'll end up, but I don't care where things start. I'd be fine with a commune. I, I, you know, I've had many friends who lived in communes and uh, many more who've um, sort of uh, advocated commune-like things, including syndicalist ones. Like, that's part of the problem. People ask me, you know, where, where are all these good leftists? Well, a lot of them aren't on fucking social media because they choose to stay away from it. And as a result, all these people who are in their social media bubbles, they say that they don't exist because, you know, Pixar didn't happen, you know, all these internet rules sort of bleeding over into the uh, physical world, into meat space. And so um, part, of, part of the problem is that everybody is polarized and intentionally so because they believe their paradigm to be the only way forward. Um, and, you know, the left that you came from, um, they probably think that the only way forward is the left. They're probably those sorts of people that believe that uh, history has a liberal agenda and et cetera, et cetera, insert bumper sticker. Yeah. Um, the people I come from are, are neocons. I was a neocon in high school who said Bush did nothing wrong. Like that's a quote somebody can find if they look in the right like books. Um, and so I'm... I come from the persuasion of, of being a preacher's son, being raised to be a preacher. I was a heavy Republican supporter. I thought we should glass Iran. And now I'm here because I have, you know, a brain. And I decided to use that in order to, like, sort of decipher the codes that these people were using to slip messages in where they oughtn't be. And when you start to realize that a lot of these things are designed to get you to buy one thing that you think is true so that you buy the rest of it. You realize that the state is basically one like big collection of cargo cults, every one of them competing for the most members. And that's what the left and the right are. They're the two like um, Democrats and Republicans, you know, uh, communists and Nazis. They're the, uh, the, the, the biggest clusters of the hyper-concentrated cargo cultists. And what that means is that anything outside of their chamber will be considered heresy, that including the left and the right. The left's heresy is capitalism and the right's heresy is communism because like, they've got different forms of hierarchy to advocate. And both of them think that any anybody who leans like slightly in the direction of the other, uh, further than the absolute furthest, anybody who doesn't seem to be trending more and more extreme left or more and more extreme right is in the wrong because they're leaving the cult that they joined. That's the point. Like, you're not you're not wrong. You're just a heretic, and that's a problem for those who want acolytes and not real thinking people. Liz is just writing a furious storm over here, and it's hilarious to me. Okay. I feel like she's going to have to go and do a whole ton of reading after all this. I mean, there's probably going to be some reading involved. I'm not going to lie. All right. Well, I'm not going to lie. This has been way more political talk than, I, than we're probably used to on the show. He said he was intense, though. He did warn us. No, we I, like I, intense. I, we, we're digging it. I've listened to him before. I know he's intense. It's, it's part of the reason I want to have him on. I guess it's, it's a different type of personality I, we haven't, haven't tangled with. Right on. Um, I've, I've had a couple conversations with him in like Facebook message groups, and then people invited Mike Shipley, and I just don't want to be a part of that because I don't trust him. <sighs> anyway, well, I don't trust most people. <laughs> He's a reasonable person. What was that? Sorry, you cut out just a little bit. Uh, I said I don't trust most people, but uh, Mike Shipley is normally a pretty reasonable person, so I'm I'm fine with him. Well, good for you. I've not had the same experiences, but then again, I you know I have that Mises Caucus thing where everyone just calls me Nazi before actually talking to me. So, I suppose there's that. Um, all right, let's get the stuff I want to well, talk you about. <laughs> So, um, what kind of uh, music are you into? You sent me a very, very wide-ranging list of stuff uh, the other day, but I have not shared any of that with Liz. So, okay, so I, I, I think primer. I think it's it's difficult to say what I'm into because I'm into too fucking much. Like, 
I, I've, I've listened to probably thousand plus genres of music and enjoyed them. I think it's better to say what I don't like. It's better to just exclude. Um, so, so I don't like most trap. I don't like pop country at all. Um, and there are several genres of pop music that I don't really like, mostly the ones that seem to be appealing to the baser instincts of people rather than telling them to lift themselves up. That being, um, you know, more like the Katy Perry's of the world rather than the Lady Gaga's of the world, the Beyonce's who have no talent versus the um, the Avril Lavigne's, you know? So th the sort of people who want to keep you on their pre-manufactured route so you keep buying their CDs and they don't really give a shit about how you live. Whereas there's some musicians in the pop industry that seem to want you to empower yourself. And those ones are the ones I can tolerate because or enjoy because like there are some good pop bands out there but for the most part i don't like pop because i think it's churned out for the specific purpose of draining people's wallets for the next craze so that they can have the right merchandise to look good at school or something um but like those are the primary things i think i could i could x out um okay. like primarily uh, go ahead oh no no she was agreeing i was just agreeing i'm, I'm listening <laughs> But primarily, I like uh, industrial and industrial subgenres. That's what I most often listen to. No arguments here. Nice. So, um, it, it, obviously, that that leaves this next question kind of wide open. I wouldn't even know what to expect. But uh, do you have like uh, any really good live music experiences, like shows that you've been to that really stand out for you? I grew up uh, way too poor to afford most live experiences, so I can't say as I've had many. He stole my, uh, the he one stole my that line. I was at that sticks out. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the one that sticks out in my mind is um, is a theory of a dead man and uh, in Hinder concert, and uh, that one was great. I also used to be a Christian, and uh, I still remember my Skillet slash Pro Project eighty six experience. And uh, those two bands are actually really good, even like outside of the religious aspect because i'm an atheist now but um like i still appreciate a lot of christian music that's very good um but i like those those are the experiences that stick out in my head like for different reasons obviously because i wasn't getting a keg passed around to me at the uh, project 86 concert but um <laughs> you know yeah but but my my goal, my bucket list has like probably 900 bands on it, and uh, you know it's fucking sad. One of them just had a the lead singer die. Uh, the key, uh, fuck, I think his name was his last name was Smith. I think it was Keith Smith of um of of the Prodigy. He oh. just uh, died. Oh, in 49. That, I just saw that, and I was not excited about that. <sighs> yeah, he was on my bucket list. So so was Wayne Static, and then Wayne Static kicked it. What is it about industrial music and apparently heroin? <laughs> I was gonna say there's there's some things that people put along with that life, maybe. I suppose. Well, the prodigy, I think he just died. I don't think he died of an overdose. I think he like probably had hypertension because of his tour schedule. He was always insane. Mm. Oh no, there is that for sure. Well, and I think I mean in general, I think that was always that's the the bigger issue. It's not really the I don't know many of them that die of the overdose. It's just the strain that they put themselves under. Honestly, uh, I think methamphetamine oh, yeah. and methamphetamines are probably the bigger killer of people outside of like some very specific uh, instances. Because I mean, like, uh, what's his name, Jesse from the Eagles of Death Metal, like. He, he, before he cleaned himself up, that was his big thing. He was just downing meth. And he, he said, like, it got so bad on tour that, like, to keep the calories in him enough to keep from, like, losing all of his weight, he was eating gallons of ice cream a day <laughs> just because of the, the calorie content that he was burning off doing meth to stay awake and, like, do the tour. Yeah. What? And see, that's why people should get nutrition supplements instead of doing that. Because fucking, like, there's so many good ones out there. Like, you can get, you can, go, you can go to Gainful and get a protein powder completely like customized for your particular diet. It's fucking nuts how easy it is these days to do that. But I guess that didn't exist a few years back. So that's true. The article I'm thinking of was probably about a decade ago. Now it was a much different yeah. world even ten years ago. Yeah, people are far more health conscious and trying to kind of find that. Because well, we're way all to fucking dying, nutrition. Liz. Well, I know, absolutely, and you, you got to do something. Well, about I mean, it. some people are. <laughs> some people are still meth healthy. I mean, Michael Moore is still a fucking giant. Yeah. Well, I can't comment on Michael Moore because I'm a big fuck right now too. I'm working on it, but it's tough. Probably not Michael Moore size though. I hope not. 
I, I can tell you this much. My face doesn't jowl like his does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's good because he looks like a fucking jellyfish with the walrus attached. Um, <laughs> I mean, I feel like that that kind of speaks to that stress element too. Like people figuring out ways to manage it. I, I, I mean, I think going. he's just a fucking evil human being. And well, perhaps that his outside is just trying to match his insides. That, that's a whole different conversation. But speaking of um, things in your life, things that keep you going, like how does how does music fit into your life? Is that is that part of your, your formula there? I know that podcasts took over mine, so I don't listen to as much as I should have. I, I, part of the reason I started this was to force myself to listen to new music. Well, so my primary thing is podcast. Is, sorry, is music. My podcasts are mostly research. Like, I'll, I'll research. Like, I, I the camera wasn't or the the calendar wasn't synced properly. So, like this this is happening three hours sooner than I expected. But um, what I was doing at the the given time um, was uh, the research for the podcast I just launched, which was Weekly Hellscape, and. Um, the the research I do is normally like I'll devote an hour a day all week and then four hours pri- prior to recording uh, the the show um, on Fridays and then I'll release the uh, podcast like uh, an hour before although it's been late both times so I can't really say that but I'll try to release the podcast an hour before. Um, either way, uh, music is like essential to it. I wake up, well, okay, so I think I should start sooner. I go to sleep, and part of my going to sleep ritual before I don't look at blue light screens for a while, um, before I like actually hit the hay, because uh, it triggers parts of your primal brain that are used to the sunrise, and uh, that's one of the reasons that people are seeing so many eye issues these days, because they're staring at screens all the time. Um, so I try to like eliminate blue light 30 minutes before I go to sleep so that I don't like have most of that my sleep is as good as possible. Yeah, it's really and healthy. And part of that ritual is I um yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and 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 part of that ritual is I'll um I have an Amazon Music subscription and I'll take the uh, um the library that I have of like probably 5000 songs at this point and uh, I'll just put it on random and uh, go forward a song until one that fits the day's the next day's mood uh, shows up on random, and um, then like I wake up, I take 300 milligrams of caffeine immediately, and I turn on whatever song it was, and immediately get into my work with music going on for like probably two or three hours before I need a little bit of silence. But then like I'll have I'll cook breakfast, I'll eat that, I'll um, you know bring that back into the room and then I'll put on my headphones and there's more music that happens because like basically the the more music I have going at any given time the the more I can focus and the better I can time things because I know how like long generally the songs are and so I can like use them as timing markers say I'll have this done before the chorus and I'll have this one done before two more songs are done and things like that like I'll time showers I'll uh you know keep my work on on rhythm if i'm working outside um and like it's generally music is my clock and if if that gives you an idea of how much music i listen to um that that's probably one of the best answers i could give that's that's awesome the most the most uh pointed answer we've ever gotten that question Well, it's really really interesting though because i i've never used it for working but i do do that like okay i'm gonna turn on this song and i'm getting out of the shower when it's over like that's that's uh it's really interesting that that's um, part of your workflow, and I would I would be interested in seeing how that helps in actually just working on stuff. That's cool. Well, I mean, I mean, in general, like when I used to study, like in college, part like that music was part of the ritual there because I mean, you can you, when you essentially if, while you're doing your studying, you have a specific uh, music on while you do it, and then you listen to that music back when you're like, cramming before the actual exam. Um, the same shit that fires when you were listening to it fires again when you're cramming, and it actually helps uh, with memory retention, like calling stuff to the surface. Yeah, it's it's a mnemonic device. Yeah, I'll take his word for it. Um, <laughs> so, how do you know what the oh, next I, day? Well, I, I think I, so, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to ask, how do you know what the next day's mood's going to be? But go ahead and answer that first. Well, I mean, I'm okay. So I have. Um, I have, uh, I forget which type it is, but it's the type of bipolar that, that, that they sort of included manic depression in, in the new DSM. Um, I have uh, ADHD and um, 
like occasional spats of PTSD. I've had night terrors since I was four, um, and all five senses in my dreams. So if I get hurt in my dream, it feels like real pain. Um, and that sounds like one of those edgy teenager things that you see on Tumblr. But like, what all of that means is that basically I'm always at least a little angry. So there's a baseline there of at least anger. Um, so like, I can generally determine that the next day um, I'll need something that keeps me in that sort of angry headspace in order to best use the tools that I have. Because I, I don't really consider these disorders. They're just tools. As far as I'm concerned, like, I've looked into... There are some interesting scientific uh, articles that you can that you can read where they say that this particular kind of mentality wouldn't have been considered a disorder during the times of hunter-gatherer tribes when everybody had to go out for their own stuff. Um, it would have been considered an evolutionary advantage, and these sorts of people would have been lifted up to the status of like great warriors and tribal elders. Um, but now that we have a society where the meal is brought to your table by people you've never even met, and you don't have to worry about it, and the killing is done without honor and with like great manufacturing and uh, basically churned out, um, most people just want somebody who goes along to get along and doesn't fuck up the flow too much, and they call things like this disorders. So. When I um when I plan my my next day, the baseline is anger because I know I'm gonna be angry, um and beyond that I just sort of try to pick because I, I generally schedule my days pretty rigorously. What am I gonna be doing the next day, and what kind of motivation do I need to talk about X, Y, and Z in the most effective way possible? Like this morning, I woke up, and the song that I turned on was uh, the Mephistopheles of Los Angeles by Marilyn Manson. That was the uh, the song that I random picked the previous night and um and it worked exactly the way i needed it to i got everything done that i needed to in order to log on to my computer and be fully dressed and prepared um had this um by the end of the song i was already checking my twitter notifications for weekly hellscape and um and that's that's what i like to do with it i like to have that sort of like, like flow of i'm waking up this is the soundtrack for today and generally have enough randomness that it has that novelty so that I don't lose the dopamine kick for each individual song even though I've probably heard each one of them like you know 40 or 50 times that's uh it's really interesting because I I stumbled upon this podcast uh, it's called faster than normal but it's talking about you know a lot of the stuff that you're talking about in managing like ADHD and um some of the other disorders that can kind of go in concert with it and it's just it's really interesting that you found a way to to manage that and um to plan your life in a way that works i'm, I'm trying to get my my shoes together uh, <laughs> with that stuff but uh it's that's really cool to hear so well and and you know i would the thing is like there are people who can focus on one thing well for a long time with no distractions um and when i found out i wasn't one of those like at first it kind of sucked because like I didn't know what to do with it, but basically what I figured is if my brain is going to stay in overload mode, I'll just stretch it on purpose. And ever since then, I've noticed everything is easier to access. I have like better information retention. Um, I've, I also use a, a, a Spreed or Spritz. Um, I use Spritz more often because it's a bookmark and I can just click it to like screw articles into my brain to the beat of music. Um, like at 750 words per minute is is where I'm normally like reading at these days because I can just screw the article into my brain with with one of these programs. Um, and like when, when you do that, when you know how your tools work, you can use them. A lot of people don't like. They assume that when they when when they're given one of these diagnoses, that that's it they're gone forever you know that, that there's no way to manage it without pills without you know listening to a constant flow of information from a doctor and they think it's over like if they don't follow basic instructions from these people i have been offered medication by doctors very intensely they they do not like the fact that i'm unmedicated but um like i'm not gonna dumb this down if this works and I think I can make it work like there are people who've tried to do what I'm doing with similar situations and burned out but there are also people who have like excelled and I think I can be in the latter category I'm not 100% sure yet like there's there's there have been times when I've stretched myself way too thin but you know I I, I think it's just a matter of trial and error and, and, and when I get used to it I'll probably be very very good at it because like 
like pe people assume probably I'm older. They normally do. Um, I don't get carded at places and I haven't for like years, but I'm 26. Um, like I'm still not fully me yet. Like when I'm 30, I'll know whether I fucked up or not. <laughs> Right on. I mean, I'm still waiting to really find out if I fucked up. I kind of assume it, but... I'm going to figure, <laughs> you, you try shit, and if it works, you keep doing that shit. And if it doesn't work, then you try <laughs> something else, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't think, at least not all hope is yeah, gone definitely. by that point. So, all right, well, here's a... I, I'm actually real curious about this next one, because I can only imagine, given how much music he ports to listen to, is there a specific song or type of music that you have a really powerful memory attached to? Well, I mean, plenty. Um, I mean, speaking of pop music, when I was growing up, I mean, I don't really like this anymore, but um, like I used to jam to the Backstreet Boys with my mother. Uh -huh. I mean, like there's that. Um, but I mean, I used to listen to new metal with my workout partner who I trained uh, some martial arts with. Um, I used to scream to, uh, to to things like Megadeth when I was angry after working at that shitty Jack in the Box job I recently wrote about. Um, <laughs> like, there there are they're probably like countless examples I could bring up. Um, but like, I sort of try to think of it like this: I want to attach the music to a memory rather than the other way around. I want the music to I, I want the music to be the building block for all memories. Um, so I would say that like when I found certain genres, that would be the more powerful music memory association for me. Like when I found out about industrial music and found out that it was basically everything that I had wanted in any other genre, um, it was, it was a click for me. Like it, it's, it, it's exactly the sort of thing that somebody who s said they should have been born in the 80s a lot when they were a kid uh, likes when they're an adult. And, like, if you look at the full breadth of industrial and all the subgenres, like, there's a lot you could get into. Like, I even like a lo lot of the noise stuff, like the pure noise, um, like Endon and, uh, and Capsule 444. Um, but the reason I know about either of those is because of Skinny Puppy and because 7K did um, a tour with these people and he released an album called Japanese Electro Punk Brutality. And um, <laughs> th this album is something that opened my eyes to the world of noise music in a way that it hadn't been before. And, um, and so like for a year, I jumped down the rabbit hole of noise music and I found like great albums like Grey Machine, um, Disconnected, is 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 an amazing work of art and i use it for like relaxation focus um anything really and, uh, and i recommend people check it out although you probably won't be able to relax to it apparently that's not very common in listener experience yeah i was gonna say <laughs> that's um, not my experience with that but, stuff but you know that's that's what this is about people's personal experiences with stuff right because it, it is it's always personal it's never never universal i'm sure there's people that relax yeah. to nickelback yeah, well, and that's like nails on the chalkboard to me also yeah well, and, and, and it's sort of like that with with the rock and metal I, I, I still listen to. Like, basically when I found out about Alice Cooper um, and everything that descended from his career, a lot of stuff became clear to me. Like, um, when, I, when I found, like, there's a movie called God Bless America where a girl <laughs> One of my in, the, in the movie says basically, every, yeah, okay, so you know, you know her rant then about Alice Cooper? Oh, yeah. Because that's pretty much 100% accurate. And uh, and when I found out that stuff about Alice Cooper, because I watched a lot of VH1 Classic when I was 17 and 18, um, and like Eddie Trunk waxed huge about Alice Cooper, um, and I found out all this stuff, and I found out about all the people who had been influenced. I found out about Rob and White Zombie because of Alice Cooper. I found out about Marilyn Manson and Rammstein because of Alice Cooper. I found out about Nine Inch Nails because of Alice Cooper. Um, Iggy Pop, uh, um, Frank Zappa, all of these people. Uh, Ziggy Stardust was based off of Alice Cooper. Um, Kiss, uh, Guar, all of these people got their images from Alice Cooper, at least somewhat. And, um, and that sort of discovery 
is more my emotional attachment to music. A, I, like my mind likes categorizing things. So there was a really interesting documentary Liz and I watched a couple years ago, and it was essentially by um, his manager, who later went on to manage uh, what's that? The Bam guy, Liz. Oh, friggin' Emerald. Uh, yeah, Emerald. Yeah, yeah like so basically the guy who used to manage. Uh, Alice Cooper's career in the like in the early days was the same guy who went on to manage Emerald's career as a chef when he was coming up, which is really really weird. <laughs> but you know he was he was talking about like the marketing side of uh, the whole Alice Cooper project, and it was a uh, it was a really strange and interesting uh, documentary. So. Well, yeah, and you know you, you want to talk marketing. There's there's an interesting there's an interesting connection between gaming and Nine Inch Nails, which is that um, one of the because you, you said you wanted me to. to come up with like five albums that i would recommend that'll be the um, next bit one of those uh, al- one of those albums that i'll be recommending and i'll talk a, a lot about because i know too much about it probably um is is year zero by nine inch nails but their marketing team was the same marketing team that did the um the i love bees campaign for halo 2 <laughs> interesting i'm gonna be honest so i mean way like, over my head things come into different ways well okay Okay, so I love bees was just a URL, and, uh, and 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 eventually things would come out that that would relate I love bees to the release of a potential coming game, and uh, and that would re- eventually you know be an advertisement for Halo Two, and um, and I'll talk about why that relates to Nine Inch Nails, but basically that was proof of concept for viral marketing before viral marketing was even really viral, um, meme culture before meme culture was understood by the main uh, mainstream, um, and so. Like that was there, and then like uh, band managers are passed around a ton. Like oh, I forget exactly which one, but I think the reason Zach Wild was was invited to be a member of Ozzy Osbourne was through Black Label Society, and because they had similar management teams. Um, so yeah, marketing is huge in that industry. I mean, that's Joe Walsh and the Eagles, even right there. Literally, that exact same story as it happened to be yeah, the label. Yeah. Somebody knew so and so. I was like, well, hey, I think I can get this guy, but you know. You know, you know. Well, <laughs> and you want to talk Nickelback? Um, Theory of a Dead Man is a band that I hugely respect. They're way They've got superior. Got a lot of great music, and uh, <laughs> yeah, but the guy, the guy was a Nickelback fan, and like the band was a Nickelback fan band, um, and like, like every one of them liked Nickelback, and they handed. Um, I forget if it was a member of Nickelback or if it was like one of the people in the in the the crew. Um but they handed them a mixtape in a pit and that mixtape finally found its way to uh, to the lead singer's ears and they got a, re- a recording contract not too long later because they found out about them through uh word of mouth essentially and uh and and so really a lot of the great acts that exist exist because they networked where other people didn't they took opportunities that other people wouldn't and you know that ties back into anarchy because it's all about opportunity cost it's about what you do with what you have not about what you'd have with what you would i mean it's 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 markets like you you find the opening and you take it and the opening may not be the same every time you know it's going to change it's going to shift um and you know some people look at that as a problem some people look at that as like a you know, the best thing for it. I personally, I think that that like the the strength of anarchy is in the fact that, um, that because markets are, are impossible to stay static, like I, I I would find difficulty for power to amass in the way that it does currently, just by by default. Unless you have some type of structure holding it in place, it's always going to move and shift because that's just how people work. Right. Yeah. And um. So that's one of the reasons that I support the anarchy I do. That's one of the reasons that I try to utilize the tools that I have, um, because I think fundamentally, uh, people people misunderstand the power of markets, and I think that that's one of the primary problems with with the world the way it is, is that markets aren't economic; they're catalactic. Um, it's it's part of sort of a Misesian understanding of of the way economics works and um and thinking of the economy as like well thinking of markets as an economy as a single house with many different functions and organs rather than a series of sorry a series of interested parties um in various actions is a mistake 
um, when you realize that people are just interested parties, you can serve their needs in a very specific way. Um, and I think many musicians get that on some level because they know what their audience wants and they know exactly how to deliver it while not selling out. Mm -hmm. Except the people who do sell out, you know, like fucking Millie Vanilli or Justin Bieber or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that Millie Vanilli ever truly sold out. I think they just saw an opening in a market for pretty black men <laughs> and then made that record. However, they could manage well, to right. make that record. I, I look well, at that. Right, as, I they look, also lip synced. Well, which which is standard practice now. Like they don't even pretend that they don't lip sync anymore. I think that's that's the thing about it. It's so weird. Is that like that was such a scandal. But if you go and see many like pop acts now, they're not actually singing because you can't do those dance moves and sing at the same time. A lot of it is just pre-programmed well, shit, and that's the experience you want. That's the experience you, you can have, I guess. Not for me. They were the first ones to to get well, caught, though. Yeah, there's that. Well, I mean, but you you can if you're if you're smart about it. Like Gaga does sing. She sings live every concert. That's one of the reasons I respect her. She also plays four instruments. Um, I, I get some shit occasionally because occasionally I kick the beehive, which is Beyonce's Twitter army, and uh, and say Lady Gaga is massively superior and Beyonce sucks. Because the only good thing about Beyonce is her voice, and it's barely good. Um, so, but Lady Gaga, she can play five instruments. She's uh, she's an actress. She can like convincingly play roles, um, and she's. She tries to throw a lot into the art aspect of what she does. She's not just there to, you know, be a pretty face on stage lip syncing. She threw her entire life into it. Like, I think she learned ballet in order to do her act the way she sometimes does it. And that, to me, is commitment. Like, everybody focuses on the outfits she had to gain publicity initially. But that was sort of part of the point, is that she was saying that you needed some kind of gimmick in order to succeed in pop. So here's mine. Yeah, I have no argument on, on any of that. I don't particularly like Gaga, but at the same time, I, I don't discredit, you know, the skills and what she's accomplished and what she's done. So. Well, someday, if you want an interesting thought exercise, compare the message of the majority of early Alice Cooper music to Mary the Night by Lady Gaga. Oh, I, I can already tell you, just knowing what I know about both of those artists. <laughs> like, I mean, Alice Cooper, especially in his day, there was a very specific thing they were doing with that, or I should say that he was doing with it. And... You know, I, I appreciate. There's the academic sense, which I love thinking about those types of acts, because where there, there's just a definite creation that the music itself is, and that the these people that create the music are. They, right. they make all well, those. Well, and, and go on. Go ahead. No, you're good. Well, just. The, the interesting thing about Alice Cooper is the only reason he had initial success is because of Zappa's label. And the reason Zappa liked him is because when he was, like, staring out this broken door window, um, creepily, uh, with, like, 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 sheets draped across his face, singing, nobody likes me, and screaming it at the audience, um, he actually cleared the club. Nobody was left in the club except Frank Zappa at the end of the show. And Zappa knew he had to have that kind of power on his label. <laughs> God, I love Zappa. It's so fucking weird. <laughs> He's trained as yeah, well, trained as conservative so Zappa ever. Brought him back to his cabin. Well, there you go. All right, let's uh, let's get into the five. What 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 would be five albums that you recommend to people, and why? Okay, so these are pretty much gonna be political, um, because well, I mean, political slash anarchist, whatever. Are you political? I, I think. I, yeah, well, I, I think these have, yeah, I, well, I think these have a, a, de a decent breadth on their own, but what surrounds them, I think, is hugely important. Um, I'll start with one that I can probably, like, this isn't a top five leading to number one, because I don't, I, I don't really do top five anything. I think that there's too much in the universe slash the world to, to list a top like 1,000, much less a top five. I mean, that's, but yeah, that's not that's what I'm asking. Mine change thing. every five minutes. So, um, Yeah, yeah. Well, five five that I would recommend people look into that, that I hugely enjoy. Um, the first, Nine Inch Nails is Year Zero. Okay. It's amazing music, and it has great messages on its own. Um but what it was, was the political statement he wanted to make about the future he saw arising from presidencies like that of George W. Bush. And um, 
his particular mentality at the time was that this sort of hyper Christian conservatism that ignored science and the environment because God said something different was hugely problematic. And um, and so he created not only an album, but an expansive universe surrounding that album that was what that album was about. Um, and he created this to flesh out the story that he was telling in the album in a way that the music really couldn't. He recorded well, not, not not he. I should say Nine Inch Nails, the band, because it's not just Trent. But um, Nine Inch Nails put their, their their minds behind this one instead of just their physical talent. And um, you have like fictional like uh, police raids in footage form that you can access on hidden websites. Um, you've got an entire fictional universe built around why the characters in the songs were saying what they were saying. Um, there's a drug in this. The, the, the reason the outside of the album looks like it has a hand on it, uh, reaching down from the sky, is because that hand is called the presence. And it's a group hallucination um, that people who are influenced by this drug sometimes see as a side effect. And a huge religion has formed around this presence, and um, this, th this religion has uh, influenced and infiltrated government, um, seemingly from the outside until you realize that the government actually put this into the water on purpose so that everybody would fall in line, this drug called parapin, um, which is the, uh, the, uh, the alternate name for a drug that was heavily marketed by big pharma companies in this alternate universe. And um, basically, I'm gonna read from the wiki right now. Parapin is the, the brand name for man-made drug that is also sometimes referred to by its generic name, uh, Zeradine developed as a groundbreaking partnership between a major pharmaceutical company and the Nas National Institute of Health. Parapin is a complex drug that bootstraps the immune, immune system. Parapin is a revolutionary drug made possible by the advances in medical technology from the study of AIDS and other immune diseases. While antibiotics target bacteria and antiviral drugs target viruses, parapin is not designed to combat a specific disease or set of diseases. In instead, it makes the body better able to combat all disease. In the world of year zero, paraben had been introduced into water sources all over America. The government claims it is to increase the citizens' immune systems and protect them from biological terrorism. Apparently, the drug may do a lot more than just boost the immune system. Apparent side effects are an alteration of dopamine and serotonin levels. Drugs like cocaine, meth, and opal do this, while no immune system boost or antibiotic or antiviral does. Muscle spasms, inability to reach orgasm, complacency, dulling of emotions, to name a few. So, Basically, in this alternate universe, Lord. government has poisoned government has poisoned the water with a drug that causes you to be a passive subservient slave. And there's um, there's an entire uh, song devoted to the fact that somebody uh, drinks the water in order to feel better because they like basically realize that the water is their only way to feel normal again. And um, since all water sources have been tainted, uh, the people who drink filtered water are often raided by police. There are purity parties that are raided by police um, in the form of raves. Um, these parties are that are basically underground punk movements designed to combat the Bureau of Morality um, and their, their, their anti-freedom uh, tendencies. Uh, because they want humanity controlled since global warming has already risen, the ocean levels in many cities are underwater, and this has caused a huge amount of environmental contamination resulting in diseases that this drug was uh, supposedly supposed to fight. Um, the people were all too willing to drink it, except those who knew that this was probably a scam designed to get people in, or people who watched their family slowly turn into passive, docile, uh, unfucking sheep under population control a la the georgia guidestones so this album is extremely deep you can find out more information on it by going online a lot of the sites that used to be a, be accessible are down now because you know money but uh, basically this was all <laughs> discoverable because of clues on the album art and um like the actual cd had heat sensitive ink on it where if you um if you put the cd in the drive uh, and looked at it you know, before you did, it was dark. And then when you put it in the drive and pulled it out, it looked like an entirely different CD. Well, that, that's odd. There are numbers on the CD now. And the numbers were a binary code that led to a website that basically took people into this alternate universe of trying to figure out this conspiracy. And I have a feeling that a lot of people 
started to get into conspiracies because of that. So to me, this was a huge triumphant accomplishment for using music and marketing to deliver the message of anti-government uh, activism. Nice. It's crazy. Also, the story of fluoride, which is so and <laughs> gonna be a lot of lot of yeah, yeah. Well, and, and and fluoride is um is is an interesting parallel because fluoride, uh, it it does damage to the pineal gland, mm -hmm. um, and what that what that means is that there are a whole lot of things that are suppressed. Um, that is, if the fluoride at a sufficiently high level, um, which it is in some sources. But fluoride's not the only one. Like mm -hmm. I think it was ninety five percent of schools test tested uh, over a given period of time were found to have like at least traces of lead in their water that kids were drinking and this is in the real world um like there's there's huge amounts of toxicology reports surrounding areas local to fracking not the least of which would be flint which is still not clear water yet um and like generally the environment is being polluted by either intent or by accident by humans who just want industry rather than actually working for what they have. Um, and that is incredibly sad and also the reason Nine Inch Nails could even think of this sort of album because it's very nefarious and not recognizing that is going to lead us uh, right into the iceberg Kaczynski talked about when he was writing The Ship of Fools. I'm definitely very interested. The, your perspective on Nine Inch Nails is, is wildly different than mine. Um, <clears throat> you... That could be in part that I, I, I used to be in a band that was managed by Trent's old manager. <laughs> and so my uh, particular understanding of Trent is a little different. Like, to, to my well, to my, to my, to my under a person, well, the universe to, he built was fine. Well, in particular, I mean, Nine Inch Nails, I mean, is just, it's Trent. Like, he brings in people, but it's just him. Yeah. He'll take full credit for literally everything they do. That's an, just that. Uh, John was an interesting guy. Um... Trent seems like an interesting guy. I think. Well, I think his buddy. And, and, you know that, that that was an interesting thing to find out that Marilyn Manson used to record with him. Like "Smells Like Children" and "Portrait of an American of an American Family." Both of those were um, were done in in the Nine Inch Nails studio. So mm -hmm. I do know quite a bit about the fact that Trent tries to control a bit of the creative process, um, if not most of it, which is why Marilyn Manson, um, you know, John Warner eventually left. Uh, the, the arrangement that he had because he realized it was sort of stifling his creativity. Well, it's 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 funny because uh, John that I John that I know he used to he he's, did manage Manson after he left. And part of the re that was a lot of the reason was it. And it's funny because like the whole thing ended up in a shit storm where Trent ended up suing John saying, "Oh, he took advantage of me because I was all doped out on heroin." Well, no, you were doped out on heroin and spent all your fucking money, and now you just you ran out, so you need to sue the only guy you know who has it. Because, and the whole thing is like, so which one do I buy? Yeah, the, the, the guy that was a dope addict for fucking 20 years or the guy who's still friends with all of his other clients other than your fucking, your ass. But, but yeah, like you said, it's just, it's interesting, like the, the, the perspectives that people have on them. Cause yeah, I, I've always, I've always appreciated Nine Inch Nails for what they do artistically. With the exception of that one album that I really fucking hated. that sounded like, I think he made it for his kids or some shit, but. But Year Zero was definitely better. Which than one? I can't remember. I don't. I, I hated it so much. I don't even remember what it's called. I had. I had a friend who who liked it, and I, and I just looked at him quizzically, because he was typically the guy that liked only like obscure like rock and just just he he went out of his way to kind of be pretty hipster about his tastes, and and to me like listening to the record found it fucking sounded like a Disney record at points. And it pissed me off. But, but that's well, a, that's a rabbit I think hole. I'd, I think I'd have to know which one it was in order to uh, yeah. in order to like decide whether or not I agree. But it like it wouldn't surprise me. I just I've listened to the discography and I can't think of one right now that yeah. like offhand at least sounds like it. Yeah, Liz is trying to look but, it up uh, and I'm like, I, you're not gonna find it. I don't even remember. No, that's what <laughs> I disliked it that much. I don't care. <laughs> Locked it out. Um. Okay. So, whew, we got one in. Four more to go. We may just have to have an ep we may just yeah, have well, to have I an episode that's him his top five. Well, no, I mean I love the richness of the. <laughs> I know I love it too. With it though, that's really cool. Well, and and that's like so that's the kind of thing I like to see in an album. I like to see well like well researched sort of like they poured their heart and soul into it. And the, the the I Love Bees marketer was the reason that that album did so well because because that guy really knew how to translate an idea into explorable web pages. Like you can watch um, 
chat done by fictional members of this universe where they're talking and then suddenly like a raid happens on the property and like the conversation drops off and the, the guy's screaming hello hello and it's you know it's a very modern approach to the standard 1984 story yeah. and and i really appreciate like it's not it's not 100 percent original and i'm not trying to make it out like he's you know a savant who created something that's never been created before <laughs> but it was a, an interesting blend of um of 1984 uh, animal farm and um and brave new world that i think like really hit the modern day extremely well it didn't hit it well enough to to have like what everybody who loved the album for what it was wanted which was a mini series like on netflix or something um because because it didn't sell well enough because people ultimately most people aren't interested in this sort of thing but p people who are nine inch nails fans because of things like head like a hole and fucking um march of the pigs um those people um well or you know what they won a grammy for which was wish um those people weren't all alternative like lifestyle people a lot of those people were into mainstream stuff and um and when they got an album like year zero and delved into the universe um a lot of people probably opened their eyes to how similar it was to a lot of the things that were going down in the bush era that he wrote it in so i you know i'm not making any comments on his character because i don't know him but what i do know is that um like ultimately i think it did like 80 percent more harm than good um and like i just the, the one thing that pisses me off is the the amount of bands that fell off uh their anti-war and anti-government activism when obama was in office it really highlighted highlights the bias when you could write an entire full flesh album um during bush about how terrible the government is and how these consequences are going to etc uh, etc cetera, et cetera. but when you have a president who's basically bush 2.0 you have nothing to say um but then like there's that part of my brain that also says well two things either maybe he was tired because his previous anti-government efforts didn't result in you know the great revolution because people like opened their eyes um you know like doug stanhope saying i don't give a shit anymore mm. um but but like yeah, so maybe it's that but maybe it's also like it just didn't sell well enough and he needs to be able to make enough money to tour and knows that he can't and you know secondarily um if 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 he is as woke as i think he might be even though you know fucking that phrase sucks these days <laughs> um i think uh if 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 he is like on that level i would think he would understand that that obama was bush 2.0 and just be like yeah i didn't come out with an album because year zero still talk about that i mean yeah. that would make sense to me <laughs> um but oh, i was gonna say it's I, I I'm beyond like I said, I'm beyond the whole thinking of like musical culture like at, very early on in the show like the big question I'm always asking is like what the fuck is wrong with the the punk rock movement like these people like, I that's kind of how I came up and it was the whole anti-authoritarian DIY ethos like those two things like scream fucking and cap to me like so when you find these people that are like fucking Hillary shill punks and you're like no this is still garbage authority what the fuck is wrong with you like you, you want to talk about doing for yourself, like going out and making the content you want, and you want to talk about how you know government's bullshit, and then like you just go and sign the fuck up because it's not George Bush. This is this is bullshit. <sighs> well, and you know, but that's kind of like the same thing could be said. People overlook the history of, of uh, the ANCAP ideology. Uh, I wrote a piece recently because. Somebody tried to justify it when um, Rothbard said, unleash the cops on the petted and cosseted uh, vagrant class. Uh, where will they go? Who cares? You know, hopefully return to the ranks of the productive members of society. Um, something like that. I'm, I'm botching the quote, but it's uh, it, it was around the same time that Rothbard was endorsing George H.W. Bush um, with an la times column that he was writing mm. at the time and saying that we needed a platform for like extreme right-wing populism that was the piece that quote comes from so yeah maybe like there are some ancaps that are punk but the majority of ancaps um ignore how not punk the original ancap movement was yeah. and 
like, let's be real clear, Rothbard was not anarchist in his later days, um, and Mises was never anarchist. Oh no, for sure. And, and so if you want to talk the punk thing, many members of many different alternative movements uh, eventually got involved in politics. Um, for instance, Proudhon eventually became a member of parliament. Um, you know, Marx was an edgy teenager who then later became a political advisor to Lenin. Um, you know, th all these people are cautionary tales on getting co-opted, but it's not a leftist or rightist exclusive problem. It's a problem with politically like motivating your movement. It's a problem was trying to shortcut it's a problem with being impatient to the point where you can't um you can't be rational even though rationality exists because you want to get there before you die um i'm fine with the poss possibility that i won't live to see anarcho stand but a lot of people aren't um and those impatient people end up taking shortcuts and being the sorts of people that say, well, if I want to be punk rock, I got to support Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez yeah. or Bernie Sanders, or I've got to support George H.W. Bush or Trump. Um, I, I've kind of and, always told people I'm an evolutionary ANCAP in that I don't think that, I really don't think humanity is even capable of envisioning the idea. And it's going to be a long, long period of time before that would even be a, a possibility, remote possibility. Just because I don't think human beings are even evolved enough to comprehend that. Like, the fact of the matter is, is the majority of people still look for some fucking god king to tell them how to live life. It just is. Right. Well, and and that's the... So, so that's the reason I try not to go down, because I, I, I grew up neocon. I have a tendency to reflexively think the right is being unfairly targeted. Um, and I try to to eliminate that bias as much as possible because all right folks that concludes the first part of our interview with jeremiah harding can't wait to get to next week's episode where we get to have the conclusion Your blood boils, it's like retreat Climb to your mouth